Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, our cicada seminar. I'm Martha Weiss. I'm a professor of biology at Georgetown. Uh, I've been here about 25 years, and uh, I'm excited to be talking to you tonight. And I'm John Lill. I'm a professor of biology at neighboring George Washington University. And I'm also excited to be here to tell you about our work on cicadas. I'm Zoe. I'm a postdoc at George Washington University, and I'll be fielding questions in the Q&A. We can't see any of you. Um, we know that you're there, um, but um, we're just talking to our computer screens and uh, each other, and so we won't be able to to see you or interact with you directly during our talk, but you can put questions into the Q&A and Zoe will be, as she said, monitoring it throughout. And then at the end, we will um, be able to answer questions. And uh, the chat is disabled. Okay, should we go ahead and get started? All right, I am gonna share my screen. and move into present mode. Okay, I think it's safe to say that here in the DC area, all of us could be said to be expecting and we are expecting the cicadas that are gonna be emerging from the earth within the next few weeks. And so we're glad to have you here this evening to join us to, to learn about what to expect as we are all expecting. I want to start out with the backstory to our presentation, um, which began in 2004. John and I were both entomologists with young kids, and uh, we were utterly thrilled by the emergence of the periodical cicadas, and our kids and their classmates and their friends were all excited, but everybody, including us and all the kids, had tons of questions. And at that point, information was not readily available. And we were a little frustrated that there was not a way for us to, to learn and share some of the things that uh, we wanted to know about that. So 17 years passed, the brood 10 babies have grown up, both the insect babies and the human babies. And um, uh, here we are. Um, as 2021 got closer, John and I teamed up with a talented environmental educator, Diane Lill, who also happens to be his wife, um, and with uh, Zoe, who is our great postdoc and also happens to be a terrific artist. And we got together to put to get to, to assemble some resources that would be useful for uh, this new generation of kids. Realizing that a little bit of information could tip the balance between fear and fascination, we really felt that it was important to, to aggressively try to get information out about um, the cicada emergence. And we really didn't want to miss this once in a generation opportunity to help explain to um, kids and people in general that um, insects overall and cicadas in particular are really cool. So with that introduction, first we're going to tell you about the cicadas. And then we're going to tell you about the, the free English and Spanish online materials that we have put together to help with the education process. And John's going to start out with the basic biology and the life cycle. And then I'm going to fill in some of the more bizarre details. And then we will come back together to talk about the educational materials. So John, you holler when you want me to um, move slides. Fantastic, thank you, Martha. So where are they right now? So we know right now the cicadas, we're already seeing emergence holes occurring in our neighborhoods and Rock Creek Park and areas around. So these pictures were taken from either our yards or from some of the local natural areas just in the last week to show the emergence holes that are beginning to appear. Um, we have yet to discover any nymphs um, exiting their tunnels but we know that they're gonna be coming soon. So um, this is a really useful calendar of cicada events. 
And you can see here the series of events that are going to take place over time. So the different colored categories indicate the different events in the cicada story. So the red arrow indicates where we are just right now today, about April 15th. And we're pretty much right on track. So like I just mentioned, we're beginning to see holes and these little exit holes beginning to be dug and appearing in the soil. We've also noticed some larger holes where animals um, have dug, have sensed that the cicadas are there, maybe smell them and have dug them up to get an early snack. Um, and then the next thing that we're all waiting for is the, is the nymphs will begin to emerge from these tunnels. And that is slated to occur in our area around the, the first couple of weeks of May. And that's gonna be followed by um, cicada song. The noise production is gonna start. Then we're gonna have large scale chorusing, um, interactions between adults, which will lead to mating, egg laying. Then eventually later in the season and by, well, not too much later, but by mid June, they'll begin to die off. And then the above ground party will be largely over. So it's a pretty short lived thing. You don't wanna miss it. Then for the rest of the summer, we'll be seeing some evidence of the cicadas that will continue all through the rest of the summer and into the fall. Um, and then the eggs will be hatching in the late summer. Okay, so for those that are interested, um, a really great resource website called cicadamania.com has a copy of this calendar event. So if you wanna keep track of the events where you are. Okay, next slide. Oops. Okay. So to start with just some basic information, what is a cicada? Well, cicadas are insects. Like all insects, they have three body regions, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The head contains the feeding and the sensory apparatus. So a pair of antennae, a pair of compound eyes, and some smaller um, ocelli, which are just sort of simple eyes. And then they also have a long tubular mouth part, which I'll describe a little bit more later. Then the middle region of the cicada is called the thorax. And this is where all six legs and both pair of wings attach to the body, and it contains all the musculature that's needed for both flight and locomotion. The last region of, is the abdomen, which contains many of the insect's internal organs, including those for digestion and for reproduction. Next slide. Okay, so cicadas, to place them within the large group of insects, they're called true bugs. So insects in their order Hemiptera that are best known for their, what are known as piercing and sucking mouth parts. So cicadas are related to many common insects that you might commonly see in your yard or in your garden. So things like these yellow aphids or this gray stink bug. Across the world, there are more than 2,000 different species of cicadas that have been identified, and the center of diversity is probably someplace in Australia or Southeast Asia. Where we live, we have about 17 different species that can be of cicadas that can be found. Next slide. So this green, this green and black cicada that many of you might rec recognize. Um, is, is a little bit different from the cicadas we're going to be talking about. It's known as an annual cicada, and they're large, uh, these large insects, their calls can be heard in wooded areas on hot summer days, which gives them the common name, the dog day cicada. We like to emphasize that cicadas of all sorts um, cannot bite or sting you, so if you're not afraid, we encourage you to pick one up and say hello. Some people are startled when they, if they might buzz, a type of alarm call that the male cicadas sometimes make when they're handled, but otherwise they're totally harmless. So I call these annual cicadas because what's important about these sort of more regular cicadas is that you can see some of them in any given year, which is very different from the periodical cicadas that we're all expecting that only occur every 13 or every 17 years. Next slide. So we're very lucky that we happen to live in one of the few places in the world that has periodical cicadas. Periodical cicadas are a special type of cicada where the adults appear only once every 13 or every 17 years. But when they do, they show up in, by the billions. The ones in our area are called brood 10. You may hear them referred to as brood X, but that's just the Roman numeral. 
Um, but it's also called the Great Eastern Brood because it's one of the most numerous and one of the most geographically widespread broods. Next slide. So cicadas are often mistakenly called locusts. And this is a long standing tradition that seems to date back all the way to the early colonists um, to the New World. Um, but we're going to try to disabuse you of this notion. If you grew up calling them locusts, that's not correct. Okay. So cicadas are part of a group of insects that are known as the true bugs, as I mentioned before, and whose mouth parts are modified into a long tube for sucking out liquid food um, from either plants or animals, the whole group of insects that they are related to. Cicadas have clear see-through wings and they feed underground on the plant sap of trees. By contrast, locusts are actually a type of grasshopper with mouths that are designed for chewing leaves and stems of plants. And when locusts occur in large swarms like they did in, in Europe and North Africa traditionally and still do, uh, they can destroy the crops of farmers, but cicadas do not feed on crops or are not considered to be agricultural pests. Next slide. Here's a recent picture of a swarm of what a what a swarm of migratory locusts actually looks like that was taken recently in East Africa, where the appearance of locusts is a source of great trepidation um, for local people because of the extensive damage that they can cause to agricultural crops. So this young man is trying to drive the damaging locusts from his field. It doesn't look like he's being very successful. But again, um, these are agricultural pests, whereas cicadas are clearly not. Next slide. So this is a map um, showing the eastern half of the United States. And each color on this map um, represents a distinct brood of periodical cicadas. So what is a brood? A brood is a group of cicadas that emerge all at the same time, every 13 or every 17 years. And right now in the eastern US, there are currently 12 broods of the 17 year variety and three broods of the 13 year variety. Um, the 13 year variety, which you can see they're blue, pink, and green here, tend to have a more southern distribution. And we think that's because um, in the south, they have a longer growing season and the underground nymphs, which we'll describe in a little bit, um, have a longer time in, to access high quality food, which potentially could accelerate their development a bit. And so the fact that they only require 13 years in order to complete their development, whereas their northern cousins require 17, may have something to do with the um, differences in the growing season that occur in these different areas. Okay, so I wanna draw your attention to the yellow counties on the map. The yellow counties are or where brood 10 is found. So you can see where we are here in the mid-Atlantic, but a piece of um, the brood 10 also occurs in the Midwest. So in Indiana and Ohio, and then a little bit of occurs in Tennessee and um, even a little bit into Northern Georgia. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit to our area. So zooming in, this is a local map of where the brood 10 cicadas are likely to be found in our region. So all the counties that are colored purple had periodical cicadas during past emergences, but cicadas are kind of patchy. They might be millions of them in one neighborhood and very few in another. So, um, so even though a whole county is colored purple, that doesn't mean that the cicadas occur in every single location within that county. The best way to find out whether they'll occur where you live is to ask one of your older relatives or an older neighbor or a relative that's lived there for a long time and ask them if they remember if there were cicadas either in 2004 or the previous emergence in 1987. <laughs> so if they were there previously, chances are that they will be there again this year. Okay, next slide. Okay, so specifically where are the brood cicadas? So uh, because the type of landscape varies a lot within the large range of brood tens, um, yeah, within brood tens large range, it's worth thinking about where they're likely to be found. So these are all different kinds of landscapes that you might find in brood tens range, including agricultural fields, um, grassland areas that may be grazed, 
then of course forests, and then more developed areas, um, urban areas, as well as suburban areas. Uh, so where do you think that they might be found? Well, we have a pretty good idea. Next slide. So they're definitely not found in areas that don't have trees because the nymphs require woody vegetation in order to feed and complete their life cycle. So areas that have been farmed for a long period of time are unlikely to sustain large populations of cicadas. Similarly, highly urbanized area that have, you know, paved over and lots of concrete and impermeable surfaces are not likely to have cicadas because they cannot emerge through this. And the suburbs are a little bit of a, a variable region. So in, in suburbs that have been around a long time and have older trees, they very much very likely to have cicadas, sometimes very dense populations of them, including even in DC itself. Um, but then other newer housing developments, that, especially ones that have clear cut the area before building their houses and then planted these little scrawny trees, they may be less likely to have them now, but the more trees you plant, the more you might encourage cicadas to colonize your neighborhood, okay? So again, cicadas are found where there are trees, especially older trees. Okay, next slide. Okay, so our brood 10, it turns out, is not just one species of cicada, but three. So like many of the broods, there's a mixture of species that co-occur and are synchronized together on the same exact time cycle. So we have three species that all look pretty similar. They all have or, um, red eyes and orange and black bodies. And they're all in the same genus, Magis cicada. And Magis is Latin for more or greater, referring to the large, the large number that occurred dur during their rare emergences. To tell the species apart though, you need to look at their abdomen, okay? So the, the most abundant species in our, in brood 10 is Magis cicada septendecim. And it has an abdomen with mostly large orange stripes on the abdomen. The next most common one is Magis cicada cassini, which has an abdomen that's almost entirely black. And these guys are quite a bit smaller than um, septendecim. The least common one is Magis cicada septendecula that has kind of a alternating stripes of orange and black. So if you want to pick them up, you might be able to tell what species occur in your neighborhood. Next slide. Okay, this lovely painting that Zoe, Zoe painted for us and for our educational materials um, shows the life cycle of the periodical cicada in a, in a very succinct form. So we're going to start in the lower left-hand corner here, starting underground where the fully grown nymphs there are right now. The nymphs will be, um, be emerging in the next couple of weeks from the soil. They will crawl up any hard surface like a tree or a fence and, and then where they will molt um, to the adult stage. The adults then, after hardening for a couple of days, will fly up into the canopy where chorusing will begin, singing, mating attraction, mating will happen in the canopy. Then the females will fly off and look for appropriate places to lay their eggs. Um, and that at that point, the adult stage is gonna be essentially over. So then after that show is over, this, the eggs will incubate for a, several weeks, many weeks actually, um, and then later in the summer, the tiny nymphs will drop from the twigs back into the soil where the brand new first instar cicada nymphs will dig into the soil and begin to look for a root to begin feeding. And those individuals will be living underground not to be seen again until 2038, the next emergence of brood 10. Okay, so next slide. So cicadas have only three life stages. They have an egg, a nymph, and an adult. After the eggs hatch later this summer, the tiny first instar nymphs will burrow into the soil where over the next 17 years, they will molt four times underground out of sight. Right? Insects of all types need to molt because they have an exoskeleton. They have a skeleton on the outside of their body, which requires them to shed it each time they need to grow bigger. And so the molting will occur underground as these insects grow these insects are solitary for all of this time. They're alone in their little chambers underground, just growing and feeding, moving around a little bit, sometimes to find a new place to feed. Um, finally, then the fully grown nymph, which is what's gonna happen in a couple of weeks, will emerge and uh, molt to, to the adult stage. 
Now the fully grown nymphs have red eyes and they look similar to the adults, except they lack wings and they're not reproductively mature, but otherwise they look pretty similar. So the transition from nymph to adult, we refer to as incomplete metamorphosis. So it's not a super dramatic change, but it certainly is a change. This is a little bit different from uh, the more typical insect life cycle. Next slide. Um, which you may know, so in this case, a butterfly, uh, which has four life stages. So the equivalent to the nymph here is the larval stage, which is the feeding and growing stage. But you can see there's a dramatic change from the larva to the adult that's more dramatic than occurs in the cicada. And so this stage has, in order to, to have this dramatic transformation, it requires an extra stage known as the pupil stage where the formal metamorphosis actually occurs. And so this is referred to as complete metamorphosis. Next slide. Okay, so one of the most interesting things about periodical cicadas is their incredibly long lifespan. If the whole circle here is 17 years, you can see that for almost all of the 17 years that periodical cicadas are alive, they're in the nymph stage, which is shown in orange. They're underground, out of sight, slowly growing. The very tiny slivers of blue and red indicate the amount of their life that they spend as adults and as eggs. So we estimate that almost 99% of their long 17 years is spent in the nymph stage. This makes periodical cicadas among the longest living insects found anywhere in the world, which is really astounding. So I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Weiss to continue the presentation. Okie doke. Thanks, John, for uh, getting us through the life cycle. Um, Cicadas are herbivores, which means that they eat plants, but the part of the plant that they eat is liquid. Um, instead of chewing on leaves, they, they drink plant sap. Their mouth is like a straw that pokes into and sucks up fluid from the underground roots of plants. And you can see this, um, this straw-like rostrum or beak right here, and you can see it in the, the real guy as well. Um, because the, the xylem fluid that the cicadas feed on is mostly water and doesn't have much in the way of nutrients, um, it's not enough for them to survive. And in fact, in addition to cicadas, all other fluid feeding insects have to depend on bacteria which live inside their bodies to provide the amino acids and vitamins that are essential to their growth. So I, I have just been learning about this and I think it's incredibly fascinating. The um, bacteria that live inside the cicadas um, live in these little, inside these balls of grapes and they live in special organs that are called bacteriomes. So cicadas have paired bunches of grapes in their abdomen. And um, if we look inside of a grape, the grape is packed with cicada cells, and then inside the cicada cells are two kinds of different bacterial cells. And these guys, these two separate bacteria together make all of the essential amino acids that the cicadas need, and they make the B vitamins that they need. And when I say essential, I mean that without these bacteria, the cicada would not be able to survive. And that also means that um, a thoughtful mother cicada needs to be able to provide these bacteria to her future offspring. So this figure down here from a, a very recent paper shows that the bacteria migrate from one of these grapes and move over to where the eggs are forming. And then a little packet of bacteria is inserted into each egg. It's called a symbiont ball. And if an egg doesn't have that symbiont ball, that offspring won't be able to survive. Okay, so here we are. This is where we are right now. The cicadas are either in their burrows or they have tunneled up and are somewhere in the six to eight inches below the surface on the side of their burrows. They have white eyes for the first 16 and a half years of their nymphal life. And then in the winter before of the spring where they're about to come out, their white eyes turn bright red. 
And uh, my husband was digging in the garden in, on Thanksgiving and he brought this little cicada that he had um, unearthed over to me and I looked at it and was admiring it. And then all of a sudden I noticed the red eyes and I thought, oh my gosh, they know that they're on the runway. Um, they, they have gotten the signal and they know that they're ready to, to come out. And I just wanted to point out here these little wing buds, and this is a, a chitinous coating, but it has inside of it the structures that are going to turn into the cicada's wing. Okay. So um, this is this is what we're all waiting for, um, and uh, it's scheduled to happen in our area sometime between late April, early May, or up until maybe the 9th or 10th of May is, is um, that's our cicada weather report. The cicadas use their special um, modified front um, legs, they're called fossorial legs, to dig these holes. And um, starting about a month out, they'll dig the holes up to the surface and, and hang out in the, in the holes. Um, waiting until the ground temperature reaches 64 degrees. Um, in damp areas, as John mentioned, they make little turrets. And um, apparently sometimes if you go out in the evening, you can see them um, crawling up and poking their little heads out and looking from side to side. Um, I haven't seen that yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to, to do that. Um, when the soil reaches about 64 degrees and on a warm spring night, probably after a good rain and in concert with some um, day length cues, all of the cicadas in the region are going to get the, the go signal and up they will crawl. And it happens after dark and it's really pretty extraordinary. When the, after the cicadas crawl up um, and out of the soil, they will lumber along on their six legs until they encounter a vertical surface. In a forest, that's going to be a tree or a shrub. In the city, it might be a fence or a car tire or a stop sign or a mailbox. Um, and anything they hit will do the job. And um, once they um, climb up and, and fasten on with their legs, then they begin the big transition of their lives. And this is the last molt from the nymphal exos. They're going to get rid of their nymphal exoskeleton and the adults are going to come out. And it's really fun to watch. Um, so the first thing that happens is that the back of the exoskeleton will develop a little crick, crack and it splits open. And then you'll start to see the, the, the white back of the cicada start to pooch out. And then they get into what I call the diving board posture, where they're lying um, uh, parallel to the ground with their bellies up. And uh, then they will muster their strength and do a mighty sit up and pull their front legs up onto their nymphal case and their abdomen will pop out and they'll either stay on their nymphal case or move off to the side. And then within just a few minutes, their wings get pumped full of um, insect blood, which is called hemolymph, and they turn into these um, thin, delicate structures. Um, you will see for years to come, thousands upon thousands of these little nymphal cases everywhere. Um, uh, I've, I found them, I'm sure, for a couple of years after 2004. And um, sometimes people think that they're cicadas because they obviously look so much like them. But if you look very closely, you'll see the split on the back and you'll see that there's nobody home inside. These guys um, will spread their wings within about an hour. By morning, they will be dark um, and their, their bodies will turn dark, their wings will turn golden and will tent up over their back and they'll be almost good to go. It takes um, about five or six days for the chitinous exoskeleton to harden fully so that they're ready to sing and mate. Okay, next thing that happens, and, and this is what they have been waiting for the whole time, is courtship and mating. And um, the, 
males, this is, this is where all of the, the tremendous noise comes from, the males have special structures on their abdomen that are called timbals. And this is um, a close-up drawing of a timbal made by Charles Marlott, who is the, the granddaddy of um, periodical cicada research. And the timbal is a little, um, this, this ridged membranous structure that is attached by big muscles inside. And these muscles um, contract and expand and the um, timbal buckles three to 400 times a second, um, making a loud noise. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in just a second. So the males all fly to, um, they, they gather in trees in big aggregations called choruses, and they all start singing at the same time. And, and this is where the jackhammer chainsaw um, reports come from, because thousands and thousands of males are all um, vibrating their timbals at once, and it really is um, quite a sound. Um, if a female likes, the females will fly over to the trees to check out the males, and how a female picks a particular male, I have no idea, but if she likes what she hears, she will um, snap her wings. She flicks her wings together in a little snap, and the male takes that as encouragement and he will walk toward her and then she'll snap her wings again. And after a little backing and forthing, if, if everybody likes each other, then they'll mate. Um, and it's pretty easy to be able to tell a male from a female. You'll be seeing lots of dead cicada bodies. So you can just pick them up and take a look. The males have kind of a blunter abdomen and the females have a long skinny ovipositor, which will become important in just a minute. Okay, um, let me see if this is gonna work. Here's a, a sneak preview of the sound of one cicada. So you have to multiply this by 10,000. You get the idea. There are, um, as John mentioned, each of the different broods has its own specific song, which is why, and, and the females of one brood will only respond to the song of the male, uh, not, of, not of one brood, I'm sorry, of one species. The females of each species will only respond to the song of the males of their species, which is why we can have these broods that contain multiple species so that everybody stays genetically um, within their group, but they can all come out at the same time. And I just wanted to point out that part of why the um, individual's temple noise gets to be so loud is because the male's abdomen is essentially a big hollow air sac. It's got its guts and stuff in there, but, but they, there's a big empty space. And that acts like a resonance chamber in a guitar and it amplifies the sound. So they get a lot more bang for their for their buck with their vibrations. And um, I wanna shout out to Dio Kramer who did this and some of the other illustrations throughout the, um, that we've peppered throughout the talk. And I'll mention at the end that Dio and I are putting together an 11th hour cicada book, which I'll, I'll tell you about at the end. Okay, so the male and female get together, they mate and then um, we're kind of done with the males at that point. They might hang around for a little while longer. Um, they can mate with multiple females, but they don't live all that much longer. And now we get to oviposition. Um, and so the females will fly generally to other trees away from the chorusing trees, and they'll use their sharp ovipositor, which is this long, sharp um, organ, that comes out of their abdomen and they will use it to dig a little slit in um, a woody twig. Generally, they like things about the diameter of a pencil and um, they'll choose twigs, they'll, cho or they'll choose shrubs or they'll choose trees. They're not super particular. They don't love conifers because there's too much resin in pines and, and those kinds of uh, trees. Anyway, they de will deposit about 20 eggs in each of these little slits lined up in a nice little line. And they might make three or four or five slits on each twig and they will ultimately lay about 
um, 500 to 600 eggs. Um, the eggs will um, stay in the trees in their little nest for about six weeks, and then the nymphs will attack, uh, hatch out. They're tiny little um, kind of funny looking things that look a little bit like an, a, a white ant. And I forgot to mention that um, when the cicadas, when the females lay eggs in the twigs, that can cause the leaves distal beyond the um, egg nests to dry up. And this is called flagging on the trees when we see these, these brownish red bunches of leaves. And that indicates to us that I don't know, maybe on here 30 or 40 females um, have laid their eggs. Um, this doesn't really hurt mature trees and it, some people think of it as a way of pruning the upper branches of the tree so that we'll get more vigorous growth. Anyway, um, the uh, cicadas, the, the nymphs um, hatch out and they climb to the edge of their branch and then they just jump off and they float down um, to the ground. And once they get there, they immediately start burrow burrowing into the soil because they are um, easy pickings for all kinds of predators. So they, they seem to know to, to get underground uh, ground quickly. Um, and they'll latch on to um, the root of a grass um, to start with. And then over the next six months or so, they'll dig themselves down probably about a foot, and then they'll find a, um, a tree root to hang on to. So I mentioned that the little nymphs are um, easy pickings. You will see that the big adults are also a special treat for pretty much everybody. So birds take them, possums, rats, fish, squirrels, um, raccoons, dogs, cats, um, all kinds of different organisms eat cicadas. And this is really an important part of um, the whole cicada story, the fact that they are so easily eaten. And um, one reason why they're so readily eaten is that they're entirely undefended. They, they can't bite, they can't sting, they're not poisonous. They can't get away quickly, they're kind of clumsy, and so they're just a gigantic smorgasbord that is laying out there for all to take. Um, to head off or to anticipate some questions, it's okay if your dog eats a few cicadas, but you don't want your dog to eat a huge number of cicadas because, um, as I recall, John, didn't your dogs have constipation problems in 2004? So if your dog is, um, uh, an adventurous eater, you might need to keep them inside or get a little muzzle or, or something like that. Okay, so it's not just the um, other animals that eat cicadas, people eat cicadas too. And um, people around the world have always eaten a variety of insects as very good and um, accessible sources of protein. Several different groups of Native Americans have traditionally eaten cicadas both as a delicacy and as a survival food. Not only did they eat them when they emerged in huge numbers, but they also knew that toward the end of the cycle that they could dig up under trees and find cicadas as um, a source of oil and protein during starvation times. In 2004, some chefs in restaurants in DC put cicada dishes on their menus as a special treat. And in 2004, I did go wild and cook a lot of cicadas, um, which I'm gonna tell you about in just a second, but my, my favorite way to eat them is as chocolate covered cicadas. Okay, so as I mentioned, around the world, lots of people eat cicadas and they are gaining in popularity as an economical and readily available source of animal protein. However, some people remain rather squeamish about the idea of eating bugs. So just as the Patagonian toothfish benefited from the, its rechristening as the Chilean sea bass, and prunes are faring better as dried plums, 
I am hereby rebranding cicadas as tree shrimp. Charles Marlott, who, as I mentioned, was the, the, grand, uh, the, the, the grandfather of cicada research, um, points out um, an interesting little bit of hypocrisy that, that many of us indulge in. He says, theoretically, the cicada collected at the proper time and suitably dressed and served should be a rather attractive food. The larvae have lived solely on vegetable matter of the cleanest and most wholesome sort, and supposedly, therefore, would be more palatable and suitable for food than the oyster, with its scavenger habit of living in the muddy ooze of river bottoms or many other animals which are highly prized and which have not half so clean a record as the periodical cicada. So I, I challenge you to ask yourself if you are um, gung-ho to eat a lobster or a shrimp, then you should think a little bit more deeply about why it is that cicadas seem off limits. And I hope you'll have a chance to enjoy some tree shrimp. Okay, so here are my quick recommendations. I suggest that you go out, preferably with your children, preferably with a flashlight, preferably at midnight and you let them stay up late and you collect the cicadas right at this stage. At the tenoral stage, you can just pull them right out of their nymphal cases. And I, I, if my sister's there, I know that she's cringing. This, this seems cruel because they have been waiting 17 years for this event. But um, I just have to remind you that we are only one of their many, many predators and most cicadas will not come to a good end. And so we're not making, we humans are not making a big dent. Anyway, I collect them at that stage and put them in a Tupperware or something. And then um, I do what I was taught to do when I first joined an entomology lab to, to kill insects humanely, which is to put them in the freezer and leave them in the freezer for a few hours. And they very quickly slow down and go to sleep. And then ultimately they, um, they die, but it's meant to be um, a painless and humane way to kill insects. So, so that's what I do. And then the next morning or whenever I want to, I turn the oven on to 225 degrees and I lay out my tenorals on a cookie sheet and I roast them for 10 or 15 minutes until they get brown and crispy. And these are basically like um, a, a toasted pecan and you can chop them up and use them in cookies or on ice cream or put them in your salad. Or as I said, my favorite is to dip them in melted bittersweet chocolate and let them cool on wax paper. If you wanna make savory meals, um, you can do the same thing either with um, the tenorils or with the nymphs. Um, you can blanch them in boiling water for a minute or two if you want, or you can skip that stage. I, I, you can experiment to see how you feel about the texture. Um, and then you can saute them in olive oil or, or butter with garlic or ginger or whatever vegetables you like. The nymphs are gonna be a little bit crunchier. They're not quite as tough as eating the shell of a shrimp, but um, they'll be a little bit crunchier. And my advice is to steer clear of the adults. You can, you can find a nice adult and freeze it and um, then have it perch on the top of your chocolate cupcake, but take it off before you eat the cupcake because the wings and the legs are prickly and stiff and they're just gonna get stuck in your teeth. So I say stick with the tenorils and the nymphs. Okay, why the heck are there so many cicadas? Um, periodical cicadas emerge in unbelievably large numbers and um, millions is not an exaggeration. Billions is not an exaggeration. Um, I don't know about trillions, but we're definitely in the billions zone for um, brood 10. Um, so they emerge in these gigantic numbers um, through a strategy called predator satiation. And the idea is that so many come out that anybody who wants to eat them can eat them and they won't be able to make a dent in the whole big brood. So um, even though the predators can eat them, plenty will still survive to um, reproduce. 
Uh, as I think I mentioned, they are undefended. They don't, um, they can't bite, they can't sting, they can't move away really quickly. They're not poisonous. They don't taste bad. They're not camouflaged. They have nothing going for them except the fact that somebody is more likely to eat the guy next door to them than they are to eat them because there are so many of them. And um, their numbers can range from 30,000 to three and a half million per hectare. A hectare is um, just a little bit bigger than a typical soccer field. There was one report from Illinois of 370 cicadas coming out of one square meter. So fasten your seatbelts. Um, this graph just um, illustrates nicely the fact that predator satiation actually works. Um, so here we see um, this, this curve here is um, the live cicada population. And as the cicadas are starting out in 1983 or whenever this was in, in uh, Arkansas, um, the, the birds basically are eating all of them. So the, the, gray, the gray lines are bird predation and the, and the black is natural death. So when they're first coming out and there aren't very many, the birds are pretty excited and they eat them all up. And then the birds are getting a little bit tired of them. Um, and then the cicada numbers grow and, grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And then the cicadas start dying and um, we'll see some uh, natural death um, in the black. Um, the males generally die a little bit sooner than the females. Um, but then predation kicks in again. And um, this coincides with the birds um, having laid their eggs and feeding their young in the nest. And also um, maybe, maybe the, their stuffed feel, stomach feeling is wearing off. But in any event, at, these, um, at the far end here, when there aren't very many um, cicadas left, the bird predation basically drives it down to zero. So what's really important to notice is that at both ends of the, um, the emergence, when the numbers are small and growing and when they're large and um, decreasing, it shows, it really underscores why it's so important for the cicadas to all come out at the same time, because if they, came out in dribs and drabs, the birds would have, the birds and other predators would have no trouble knocking the populations down to nothing. So it's only by emerging in these giant numbers that they can avoid their um, predators. Now I mentioned at the beginning that John and I are um, working on a cicada project and a couple of years ago we started um, a field investigation of the indirect ecological effects of periodical cicada emergence. And um, John and I are both caterpillar people. And um, so we are interested in seeing what's going to happen to the caterpillars and the oak trees that they live on in the eastern temperate forests when this superabundant resource comes out and the birds that ordinarily eat the caterpillars may well be tempted to avoid having to, to skip the, the trouble of having to go look for the caterpillars and they'll just eat cicadas. So we're wondering if the birds are gonna switch over. And so what we did last year was we put out little clay caterpillars to monitor bird predation rates. So we have a baseline of, for the whole summer of how many bird pecks we've got on our, on our clay caterpillars. And we're gonna do that again this year when the cicadas are around and it's possible that the, um, the numbers will be much lower because um, the, the birds are busy elsewhere. And if that happens, then more of these caterpillars will survive and the caterpillars will eat more of the leaves on the oak trees. And so there'll be effects on the oaks and we'll be seeing, so what we're, we're looking at is whether there are indirect effects that um, can be visible for one and two and three years after the cicadas come out. Okay, um, one question that a lot of people have, which is really uh, a super interesting question is how the heck do cicadas tell time? So these guys are underground in their burrows, in the dark, alone. I'm not sure if we emphasize that everybody is in their own tunnel in their own little chamber with their own little root, and there is no communication between cicadas underground. Nothing, nothing um, 
vibrational, nothing chemical. As, as far as we know, it's, it's every cicada for his or herself in the ground. Um, and so how do they know in the dark, in the ground by themselves to come up after 17 years and not just after 17 years, but on May 8th or whatever it is. Um, so we don't know exactly how they keep track of, um, we, we do know that because they're tapped into the tree roots, they can um, sense changes in the quality of the fluid in the xylem in the roots. And that can let them know that a year has passed. When the xylem fluid moves up in the tree, um, as the tree's getting new leaves, then they can go, okay, a year has passed. But so we know what they keep track of, but we don't know exactly how they keep track of these cycles. Um, scientists are now thinking that there are um, molecular mechanisms, maybe methylation or histone modification that allow the cicadas to check, make a little check mark on their bulletin boards about when the, the years have passed. Um, I'm going to quickly tell you about one interesting uh, observation and experiment that scientists did that, that supports this idea. Um, one year, there was a particularly warm um, January in Ohio, and a lot of the trees that were host trees to the cicadas leafed out early. And um, presumably the sap started flowing and, and things started happening. And then there was a regular freezing February and all of the leaves died. And later in the summer, or later in the spring in May and uh, April and May, the trees flushed out new leaves. And lo and behold, the cicadas that had been feeding on those trees emerged a year early. And what we presume happened is that they counted that first frost as the first year, and then the, the, the leaves that arrived before the first frost is the first year, and then the, um, the second set of leaves they counted as another year. Okie doke. Um, one other interesting element that I want to tell you about is um, the fungus that is specialized on cicadas. Um, you will notice as, as things um, probably a week or two into the, um, to the chaos that some of the cicadas are flying around and it looks like their back ends have fallen off. And in fact, their back ends have fallen off. Um, they are filled with a fungus, which um, looks like a little plug of chalk and it's where their rear end should be. Sometimes they don't even have that much sticking out and they're still flying around and walking and buzzing. And, and remember that John told you at the beginning that their flight muscles and their leg muscles are all in the thorax. This fungus attacks their abdomen. And so even if they don't have an abdomen, they can still um, fly around. Anyway, these guys um, get, the, the nymphs get infected when they are climbing up out of the soil. The spores have been waiting for the nymphs for 17 years. They, um, the fungus grows into the abdomen and uh, eats the stuff inside of the cicada and then produces a whole bunch of spores and the cicada's rear end falls off. Um, one cicada um, can contact another cicada and spread the spores and the disease spreads that way. But somebody has, has rather um, acutely called these flying salt shakers of death because when they fly around, the spores um, sprinkle out and can um, spread the infection. The, um, uh, there's one other little weird thing, a very weird thing that has just been discovered recently. Um, and that is that these the same fungus can basically hijack the sexual signals of the cicadas so that infected males um, can respond like females. And so they can fly to chorusing to trees where choruses are being held. And if a male is um, singing, the infected male will respond with a wing flick like a female. And the uninfected male will try to mate with this male who A is a male and B doesn't have a rear end anymore. 
So it's not going anywhere um, reproduction wise, but we are going to then um, spread the spores to the, to the healthy male. So it's acting like a sexually transmitted disease that is altering the behavior of the cicadas. Okay, um, so uh, after egg laying, uh, all the way along, um, cicadas coming out after egg laying, after fungus, we end up with a huge number of dead cicadas. And they are a fabulous fertilizer. They are 19, uh, 17 years worth of accumulation of nitrogen from the soil, from the bacteria that have been um, uh, producing the amino acids and things inside of the cicadas. And they are a resource pulse pulling all of this nitrogen up from below ground to the surface. And they can have beneficial effects on the ecosystems. Um, plants can grow um, uh, more vigorously after the, the cicadas are fertilizing them. Um, a researcher in uh, California studied these um, uh, pretty wildflowers and they grew much bigger and had more nitrogen in their leaves and set more seeds in the year after the emergence. And that is all the biology that we're going to tell you about, but I've been talking for too long. And so now, um, John, do you want to talk a little bit about um, our friend to cicadas materials? Yeah, so I just want to um, just quickly make a little plug. Um, so we've been working, um, as I mentioned before, with my wife Diane and Zoe to develop a series of educational materials that are really aimed at kids in grades three through seven or so, um, but they can be adapted for almost any age. And so we put together um, on our website during this area era of COVID, um, a digital notebook, both in English and Spanish, that has an, a large array of educational activities that teachers can um, use to enrich their teaching and, and teach kids about cicadas. Um, also, and all the, these materials are available free um, and we're encouraging you to distribute them to people, anybody you know that might be interested um, from our website. Um, there's also cicada themed merchandise and fr frequently asked questions and a recorded lecture that will be posted both in English and Spanish. And there's a, even a cicada haiku contest for kids to um, express their um, feelings about the cicadas. Um, this is just a little glimpse of what the notebook looks like. It's got all these tabs, so it covers science, math, history, music, language, arts, etc. This is just one of the pages from the history section that describes um, an early um, naturalist, Benjamin Banneker, who had lots of interesting thoughts about and just, uh, about the emerging periodical cicadas and asked the students to sort of reflect on this historical pack, pass, passage. Next slide. Um, our website is getting a lot of traffic, so we encourage you to add to that. So we can, we've had almost a thousand downloads of our uh, digital, or almost 2,000 downloads of our digital workbook, several thousand visits. So we're excited to have a lot of traffic uh, utilizing these, again, freely available educational materials. This is our team, my wife, Diane as well as uh, Dr. Mariana Abarca, um, who translated um, our digital workbook into Spanish. And with that, we're, um, I think, ready to take some, oh, oh yeah. actually, there's a brand new book um, by a, a, one of the prominent, most prominent cicada researchers, Jean Kritsky, all about periodical cicadas, the Brood 10 edition that just recently came out that's available um, on a bunch of different websites, including at the Audubon Natural Society, which is where um, my wife, Diane, is an environmental educator. Um, so for more information, you can check out our website. Um, I'm, I'll mention two other things. One is that there's a lot of digital information available. Um, there's a site called Cicada Mania, um, which has all kinds of great information. There's another one called Cicada Safari, which is a, a citizen science app, which seeks to, to map the sprue 10 emergence at a much more fine grained level. So if you see cicadas, you're meant to take pictures. And um, so if there are counties that they haven't been reported in, we'll, we'll know after this um, event where they're showing up. And then the last thing I'll mention is that 
Um, Geo Kramer and I are putting together a, a little book that will be available that will have her nice pictures and, and some uh, basic and interesting science as well. And so um, if you're interested in learning about that, you can just send a note. And so shall we unshare the screen and, or what do we do now? Tell me where to go. Just unshare, yeah. I have to move us. Stop sharing. We have lots of really great questions here in the Q&A section. Uh, and so I'll, I'll read out a few. Uh, really easy one to start with. John, have you eaten cicadas before? I have not, but I'm looking forward to it. All right, and now let's hit a much harder one. Where did that 17 year cycle come from? Why is it 17 years evolutionarily? Take it away, John. That's a tough one. We don't know ex why exactly 17, but we do know that the very long life cycles of both types of periodical cicadas is a really key feature. So they're feeding on a really nutritiously poor food. So that's part of the story, but other cicadas feed on a very similar food and develop much more quickly. We th researchers have long thought that the long cycles that they have are a way of avoiding um, potential anticipation by various predators that might consume periodical cicadas and be attuned to their life cycle. It's very difficult to sort of track life cycles that are so long, that are often longer than the lifespan of most of their, their um, natural predators. And so when they do come up, they're relatively a surprise for the organisms that are there. So they're not able to sort of anticipate them in any meaningful way. So. So we don't know why exactly 17, but we know why they're a long period of time. So. There's some other theories around the math that perhaps uh, smaller numbers of years and um, more even numbers of year broods were more likely to overlap and then hybridize. And once they start hybridizing, uh, if like a four year and a six year cicada emerged at the same time and hybridized, they produce offspring that emerge at four five and six years. And that way you're diluting the whole population and getting less at any given time. But that's all theoretical. Next question, why did their eyes turn red? Those are the adult eyes. And so um, what we're seeing is the beginning of some of the, the physiological changes into the adult. And so we're seeing the adult eyes through the, the um, chitin of the nymphal case. Why the adults have red eyes? That's a question we can't answer. Are the bacteria in the packets closely related to the bacteria that termites use? I think some of them are. Um, the, the bacteria in the packets are called Hodgkinia and Salsia. And I think most float fluid feeding um, insects have Salsia. I think Hodgkinia might be special for the cicadas, but um, I'm not sure about that. But one interesting thing I did learn recently is that the Hodgkinia is related to the group of bacteria that form um, nitrogen fixing nodules in, this, in the roots of um, plants. And so maybe initially the Hodgkinia came from um, this rhizobium lineage. I think termites have um, protozoa in their gut that help them break down wood, which is a really important part of their life cycle that's a little bit different from cicadas. Oh, right. Good point. Why did the uh, female cicadas lay their eggs in the branches of the trees instead of going down and just laying them in the soil? I don't know about that. I mean, in, in terms of the evolutionary history, um, do, do the other um, leaf hoppers and tree hoppers and those and, and animals like that, do they 
they generally lay their eggs in their host tissue, don't they? So it could be an ancestral state. They also might, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they stay damper, um, if they stay a little bit more moist in um, living wood. And if they put them in the soil, they could dry out. Or actually, they probably would get, get eaten right away by ants and things. Yeah, I think they might be protected up in the branches to some degree. And they take a really long time to develop. So um, they're exposed for a really long period of time. So maybe it's sort of a safe site for, for some of these eggs. I don't know. That's a good question. Are periodical cicadas able to escape specialist parasitoids? Excellent. That's for you, John. Yeah, so that's a really good one. So certainly specialist parasitoids. As far as I know, there aren't any specialist parasitoids that only attack cicadas because how could they, right? So they'd have to have time, they'd have to have a 17-year incubation time of themselves. So but but I'm it's pretty clear that people have documented some generalist egg parasitoids that and these are specialist insects that lay their eggs inside the eggs of other insects. So, um, so there are definitely some examples of generalist egg parasitoids that will probably be attacking the egg nests this coming year. And that's one of the things we're going to try to document in our lab so we can see who those parasitoids might be. How deep underground did the cicadas go? They're ordinarily um, between a foot and maybe 18 inches. So they're not super deep. And that's in part because that's where most of the, the fine tree roots are. So they need to be in the tree's rhizosphere. Um, so they, there have been reports of cicadas found quite deep um, uh, when people are doing excavations, but those seem to be um, kind of one-off things. And, and they're mostly, um, I'd say between uh, six inches and two feet. Do we know if any migratory bird species follow the broods around? Uh, which seems like a question for me since I've been reading up on the birds lately. Um, great question. There, I have not seen that in the scientific literature, but I would not be surprised since those migratory birds will often follow around outbreaks, outbreaks of other insects like bagworms. Um, so that would be a great question for scientists to be looking at this year. How do you feel about pesticides and can they be used to control the cicada population? Go ahead, John. You're shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, so um, we strongly discourage the use of pesticides because uh, there's nothing to control, right? So cicadas have been living in this area, resident for it, the present cicadas, probably for at least, scientists estimate, at least the last 500,000 years. Um, they do not really cause any harm to most things, plant and animal, um, with the exception of maybe if you just chose this summer to, or this spring to plant a brand new uh, small tree or something like that, it could get damaged. So we much prefer that you use some kind of netting to just protect it for that brief window of time when the cicadas are laying eggs, because the only damage they do is through overposition to uh, woody vegetation. So, and pesticides tend to, um, persist in the soil and in the environment and can cause all kinds of additional bad effects on the environment. So we're strongly discouraging the use of, of pesticides of any sort to try to control them. And you won't be able to control them anyway. So just give up with that notion right now. If, if it hasn't come across, we're, we, we are pro cicada and um, we, we want to be encouraging um, uh, awe and admiration rather than fear and disgust. And um, cicadas are not just not harmful, but they actually are kind of beneficial to a mature forest because they aerate the soil when they come up. They're, they're um, making nice little tunnels to aerate the soil and let water and, and gases go in there. They are bringing pulses of nutrients up. The flagging can be thought of as pruning 
um, the trees and releasing the apical dominance and getting more branching in the in the trees, they will um, they they can hurt your hurt the shape of your small apple tree or your um, the new dogwood that you just put up. And so, as John mentioned, it might be a good idea to wrap them with cloth. But the idea of, of running around to try to spray them around your uh, neighborhood is um, not going to work, not good for the cicadas, not good for you. Is there a proportion, an odd proportion of males and females that come out, or is it 50-50? It's about 50-50, but it's staggered. And so the males come out a little bit early. And so they're, they're sort of the, the fodder at the beginning. There's, they tend to get a little bit more of the early predation by the birds because they tend to come up a little earlier. In the middle, it's 50-50. And then the males tend to die a little sooner. And so toward the end, um, the females last a little longer. And so um, uh, it all evens out in the end because they're the, the food for the um, birds after they have um, started feeding their, their young in their nests. But the sex ratio is about one to one. Stephen is curious if the populations are declining at all. And I saw some other questions about climate change. Um, and Stephen also mentioned that this must be hard to measure given that they only come up every 17 years. So how would you measure that? Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of people are asking about, about that. So whether they're on the decline or not. Probably from when humans, when the, sorry, when the colonists um, first arrived, there's been declines in cicadas because of all of the conversion of forests to agricultural fields that happened traditionally. But we're in an era now where it's actually the opposite tends to be occurring in a lot of places, especially in the Northeast where agricultural lands are reverting back to forests. So cicada habitat might actually be expanding in some areas. However, of course, development is still continued. And so you know, highly developed areas are not gonna be very conducive you know, for cicadas. So climate change itself is a little bit more complicated and there's really sort of two components to that. So one part of that is with warmer springs, are they going to start coming out earlier? And everybody wants to ask that question. And the answer to that is maybe a little bit because they are definitely dependent on temperature. But um, our colleagues at Maryland are showing that photo period is also part of that story. And so they might move up things a little bit in the spring, but that probably doesn't have a huge consequence. But probably a longer term effect of climate change that might be happening is that if, in fact, temperatures are warmer for a long, consistently longer periods of time, um, then what we might expect is that the growing seasons are going to start to lengthen, even in places like we are in the mid-Atlantic. And if that happens, then what's the phenomenon of the 13-year cicadas further to the south that have a longer growing season and, are, and that therefore can develop more quickly might start to happen in our area. And there's a little bit of hint of this because um, four years ago, in, which would have been 13 years for our brood 10 cicadas, a significant chunk of them came up four years early. Um, most of them got eaten, so they probably didn't establish, as far as we know, a, a big population. But that might be hinting that the warming climates is causing them to develop a little bit faster. So if enough of them did come up in a given year, they and they were able to successfully mate and reproduce, it's possible we could see some of the 17-year species transitioning into becoming 13-year species. And conversely, in the South, there's a little bit of evidence that even the 13-year cicadas could do it in nine years. There's something about these four-year increments that seem to be really important. Um, and so the, it's a really great question whether they're declining or not. There's not good numbers estimates for any of the years, really, until this year, now with the Cicada Safari app, um, scientists at the University of Connecticut that have developed this are really trying to map the full extent and maybe even get estimates of densities in particular areas. So we're just basically beginning at the very beginning stages of collecting population level data for the periodical cicadas. And we can all contribute by this sort of, you know, um, distributed science collection with these app um, technologies. A few people were asking if we might have cicadas on the West Coast and at some point, and if not, why aren't there any out there? So 
we do know that the middle part of the country um, historically was um, a prairie habitat. The whole West, uh, Midwest and Western swath up to the Rockies was a, a tall grass or short grass and tall grass prairie, which doesn't have trees. So they didn't occur in that wide swath. So they never were able to make their way further west, I think. Um, and but what is happening is because those prairie grasslands were maintained by large mega herbivores like bison for centuries that are now pretty much gone we're seeing a gradual encroachment of the eastern deciduous forest westward, right? And so actually the cicadas may are likely to be following and tracking that forest expansion into the, into the Midwest. And if it continues long enough, it, they're gonna hit the Rocky Mountains, which might be a significant barrier <laughs> to get over. So I, I don't know, but um, yeah, they're certainly not found in any of the, the Western states th that we know of. And it's uh, pr pretty unlikely that they're gonna, gonna start expanding their range that far. They don't tend to move that quickly, so. There's also a challenge where uh, if you have brave cicadas expanding beyond those dense centers, they're much more likely to get eaten. So that kind of makes it harder for them to expand beyond where the most dense populations already are. So, right, and I, I wanted to mention one other um, there's a cicada researcher named Christine Simon at uh, University of Connecticut who um, is doing really interesting evolutionary work. And John and I were lucky to just hear her give a talk last week. And um, she was uh, talking about the, the shortening of some of these broods. And, and she used a nice phrase. She said that in some ways cicadas are trapped in their life cycle because they can't really bust out. If, if anybody tries to bust out on their own, they're, they're just gonna get killed because there's gonna be really strong pressure to stay together. Even if it's a bunch of species, you need to have the huge numbers for this whole gambit to work. Uh, tricky question here. Are there genetic signatures associated with intraspecific variation in emergence timing within a season and among years? I, don't I would say, I don't think we know, but I will say because um, people, Chris Simon talked about this a little bit more recently, that um, the signaling, at least the timing counting thing has to do with epigenetic rather than genetic markers, which would be clear because of the story I told about there being faked out by the extra um, year, right? So they, they had to, to be able to um, respond to what was happening environmentally and check it off. And so people are thinking, they're looking at stuff like um, methylation or some kind of histone modification that is not encoded in the DNA, but is an add-on to um, the genetic material. But um, we don't know, I think, anything at all about the genetic variation in the timing. I think we better, we're almost out of, well, we're a bit over time here. So I think we should probably cut that off if that's okay. And encourage you to visit our website, check out our materials. Please, any educators in the group or people with kids or kids themselves, share these materials with your, um, anybody who might be interested. Yeah, we, our, our, our message is, is Yay cicadas, and we, we feel really lucky to live in an area that has a periodical cicada emergence, and we want everybody to feel lucky rather than terrified. Or maybe from, maybe from terrified, we could get you to neutral rather than lucky, but um, uh, we're, uh, we're excited to um, see what happens, and we appreciate you coming to hear about what we can all be expecting. So thank you very much. Before we sign off, uh, will this recording be made publicly available? And if so, where can people find it? That's a Lynn question. It is being recorded. So I assume that it maybe will be on the college website. Um, yes. College will post and share the link. So um, it'll be available on the college 
website somewhere. All right, with that, um, thank you, Zoe, for, for um, juggling all of these questions. Thank you to Lynn and um, the college for hosting us, and thank you to everybody else for coming to listen. <laughs>